Thank you, Joe and Stephen. Take your Bibles tonight to Romans chapter 2. Tonight I want to talk to you about probably the most difficult people in the world to lead to Christ. It's the good moral people. And you'll see the title of my sermon tonight. It's good moral people are still guilty and deserving of God's wrath. And when you think about good moral people, we, we probably all know somebody who fits in this category. We probably know multiple people who fit into this category. But not everybody who appears to be moral is really moral, are they? I, I want to put a label on some of these individuals, and I want you to stay with me for just a minute before we get into the actual text. But I want to refer to these people as the people of the lie. They like to appear like they're good before other people. They pay their bills. They act decent in public. Um, they, they look nice. They look attractive. They can carry on a decent conversation. They're not out, you know, uh, murdering people and committing all kinds of evil. They're just a, an upstanding citizen. And they put on this persona that they're good. And from a human perspective, as we look at them, they appear good. But there's some danger in just taking things at their appearance, aren't they? We've all met people who are concerned about their image, their appearance, their outwardly, how they're perceived by everybody else. And by the way they're perceived, they are perceived to be a good, moral person. But no matter how moral they are, if they believe that, it's a lie. Because humanly speaking, as far as God's concerned, right, all of humanity is sin-fallen. So if we believe that we're good, if we believe that we're moral, if we believe that we're a good, fine, upstanding thing and that our good deeds are going to outweigh our bad deeds and we're going to get into heaven, we are believing a lie. The people of the lie are the good moral people who think they're just good enough. Now, if you remember where we were last week in Romans chapter 1, at the end of the chapter, the Apostle Paul goes through this big long list of sins and characteristics of a depraved mankind. And and just like we would do today, when we read that list, we say, oh, that doesn't describe me. You know, I'm, I'm not uh, a sexually immoral person. I'm not covetous. I'm not evil-minded. I'm not a, a gossip. I'm not a backbiter. We, we go through these things and we say, I'm not that. And we say, so Paul can't be talking about me. And when we do that, we begin looking around. And we say, well, I might have my issues, but I'm not as bad as that person over there. Or I'm not as bad as this person. And we begin to compare ourselves against one another. Paul wrote this, and he probably wrote this to a more Jewish uh, audience than he did Gentile, although they were both in the Roman church. But if you're a Jew and you read Romans chapter 1, you're going to make the assumption that Paul is talking about the Gentiles. Because the Gentiles were dogs. The, the, the Jews were God's chosen special people. They were the good ones. And the Gentiles were the bad people. So if you read Romans chapter 1 and you're a Jew, you are thinking that Paul is talking to the Gentiles, not you. Well, it doesn't take long. Paul understands that. And through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's going to deal with the Jews and the quote-unquote moral people in chapter 2. I want to start tonight with the moral person's mistake. Look at verse 1 of chapter 2. Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For whenever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O man... You who judge those practicing such things are doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? The mistake the good moral person makes 
is in judging others. Have you ever heard uh, someone say to you, well, I don't need to go to a church because I'm a lot better than the people who come to church? That's the moral person I'm talking about. They don't see a need for a relationship with Christ. They don't see a need for being in God's house because they are in their minds and in their perception, they are better than the ones who are actually coming to church. So what are they doing? They're passing judgment. They're they're judging and saying they are indeed better than someone else. So the mistake they make is in judging others. And when you look at verse 1, he says, Whoever you are who judge... And then he says, for whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. I can remember hearing this since I was probably in kindergarten. You don't point the finger at somebody else. Because what happens when you point the finger at somebody else? There's three more coming back at you. I think that's true biblically speaking. When we point the finger and we condemn someone else, we're actually condemning ourselves. Now, this portion of Scripture ought to sound very familiar. Because in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus teaches on this very subject. And He says, with whatever judge, judgment you judge, that's going to be turned back upon you. And then He calls them a hypocrite and says, get the plank out of your own eye before you worry about the speck in your brother's eye. And the whole point of that is, is that We are not to be judging one another against each other. Because when we start judging one another against each other, we just condemn ourselves. And the reality is, we're judging against the wrong standard anyway. We should be judging ourselves against the standard of God's Word and Jesus Christ. That's the proper measuring stick. Which if we measure ourselves against that, how do we all stack up? Pretty poor, right? But when we judge against one another, all we end up doing is condemning ourselves. And he says, because you end up practicing the same thing. You can't sit there and point the finger and say, that person is coveting when you do the exact same thing. The the difference is the moral person hides it very well. If you're a sinner and you don't care that you're a sinner, it doesn't matter to you who sees you do whatever. You don't care. But if you are a quote-unquote good moral person, you have the same thoughts, you have the same attitudes, you're just very good at hiding it. And people don't know that you're, you're having those thoughts, that you're coveting, that you're lusting, that you're you know, committing evil in your mind and, and you're murdering and you've got uh, backbiting and gossip and all those things going on. You hide it very well. But who sees it truly? God does. And if God's the one who sees it all, whether you hide it or not from everybody else, God sees it and you're still guilty. You see, God is the one who is to be our judge. God is the one who will ultimately judge all of us. And then when you get to verse 3 and verse 4, Paul asks a couple of, it's, it's almost like a rhetorical question. Do you think, O man who judge, that those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? It's kind of a rhetorical question, right? Because he's saying, do you really think you're bold enough? Do you really think you're smart enough that you're going to fool God too? We, we do a great job at fooling each other, right? We can convince one another that we're, we're all right, we're fine, we're, we're holy, we're righteous, we're right with God. We can convince each other of that all day long. But the truth is, God sees it, and God is going to judge that sin. God is going to discipline us when we sin. And He's, he's saying to them, you may think you're moral, but guess what? You are not going to escape the judgment of God any more than the blatant sinner who's open about it. Then He gets the second question in verse 4. Oh, do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? What's the point of that rhetorical question? It's to drive home the point that even if you think you're good and moral, you still need to repent. You still need to come and ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins and to save you. And He said, are you despising 
the riches of His goodness. Remember what we talked about in in chapter 1 about those who were suppressing the truth. They didn't want to admit that there was a God and that God needed to be sought out. Well, if you despise the riches of His goodness, you're suppressing the truth. You're saying, I don't want what God has to offer. God has offered us freely salvation, but the person who is despising that is rejecting it. They're saying, I don't want that. And and in this question, he's saying, are you really willing to do that? Are you willing to, to reject the God who is patiently giving you an opportunity to repent? Now, let me back up again to verse 1. Because I kind of skipped over it, but the very first phrase in verse 1 is, Therefore you are inexcusable. That comes right after the big long list in chapter 1. So what he is saying to probably the Jews here, and those that think they're good and moral, that he's saying to them that you are without excuse as well. Back in chapter 1, verse 20, he says that you are without excuse for not knowing that there is a God and that you need to seek Him. He says there's no one on this planet who has a legitimate excuse that will hold up before God. So he's saying to to this quote-unquote righteous group that you are inexcusable as well. You do not have an excuse for rejecting God. Good, moral people are still guilty. They're still sinners. And if they don't come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, they are still deserving of God's wrath. Now, that's hard for these individuals to understand. But when you understand how God judges, it makes a little more sense. Look at verse 5. But in accordance with your hardness and your impotent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. Verse 5 is pretty clear. When God judges, He judges righteously. There is nothing unfair about God's judgment. It's all right. He is the only perfect, pure, holy one who is in a position to judge unrighteousness. And he says, the moral person here, and he's again referring to the Jews, they've hardened their heart and they've been unrepentant. What condemns you to hell? A hardened heart and unrepentance. It's not a matter of whether you're Jew or whether you're Greek. It doesn't matter about those things. What he's saying is when you harden your heart to God, when you willingly refuse to repent, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath. Now, I want you to get this picture in your mind. As believers, we're working toward crowns in heaven, right? We want the rewards in heaven for what we do here on earth. Well, for the unbeliever, what they're treasuring or what they're storing up is God's wrath. By their sin, they are storing up or they are laying up God's judgment that will sit there and wait until the Lord chooses to pour out that judgment. Now, if you treasure for yourself wrath and you lay it up, that day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God, that's looking forward to when the Lord comes back and judges sinners. There's actually, when you get to the end times, there's two judgments, aren't there? There's a judgment of believers, which is the... Uh, mercy seat of Christ, judgment seat of Christ, and then there is the judgment of unbelievers at the great white throne. Now, I won't take time tonight to go to these, but the judgment seat of Christ, Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. You remember he compares it to a building. You either build with wood, hay, and stubble, or you build with uh, 
gold, silver, and precious stones. And what he tells us is, as believers, when we get to that judgment seat of Christ, our work will be tested. That's the judgment for believers. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 12, we see the great white throne judgment. That is where unbelievers will be judged, and they are judged according to their deeds. Verse 6 of Romans chapter 2 says, Who will render to each one according to his deeds. In verse 6, he is referring to the judgment of both the believer and the unbeliever. You see, all of us, when it comes judgment time, will be judged according to our works or according to our deeds. So what's that tell us? Well, when we get to the judgment seat of Christ... Some believers are going to get more reward than others. When it comes to the judgment of unbelievers, there will be different degrees of punishment in hell based on their deeds. Now, we don't think about that a lot, do we? We just think of hell as being hell and eternal damnation, eternal separation, eternal punishment. But what this teaches us is that when God will render to each one according to his deeds, and he will judge accordingly. Now, if you read verses 7, 8, 9, and 10, it's very easy to kind of look at this and say, well, Paul must be preaching about works-based salvation. If you do enough good works, you get into heaven. If you do enough bad works, you go to hell. That's not what he's teaching here. He's not preaching works-based. What he's saying is that when your heart has been changed, when you've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, the evidence of that change is your deeds. The evidence of that change is your works. Because the truth is, I can't see looking at you whether you're saved or not. You can't look at me and know that I'm saved. The only one who sees our heart, the only one who sees the truth of our salvation is God Himself. What we see is the evidence of a changed heart. So when you look at verse uh, 7, it says, Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. He's basically giving you what the Christian life is supposed to look like when you've really had a heart change. When Jesus has saved you, then you should be concerned about things, about eternal life, about doing good, seeking for glory, honor, and immortality, which is heaven. But when you haven't had a heart change, when you're still lost and dead in your sin, you're self-seeking, you don't obey the truth, you're unrighteous, and what awaits that person is, is judgment, indignation, wrath, tribulation, and anguish. Now, when you get to verse 10, he's addressing the issue because the Jews' response to this would be automatically be, well, that's not us because we're God's special people. And that's why in verse 10, he says it's for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Let me put it to you this way. It's about what's in your heart and your heart condition, not about your outward appearance. God's concerned about changing your heart. Before you're saved, you've got a hard, unrepentant heart. When you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, He gives you a soft heart. He changes your heart. And he's saying that your works give evidence to whether that change has actually happened. And when you get to verse 11, he says there is no partiality with God. In other words, Jew, Gentile, good moral person, it don't matter how you want to label yourself, it doesn't matter how you want to describe yourself, God will judge everyone And he will judge them perfectly, and he will judge them righteously. Now, probably most of us here tonight would say we know that, and we agree with that. The struggle becomes, 
being able to communicate that to a person who considers themselves to be good and to be moral. And to communicate it in a way that they're able to recognize that they too are a sinner in need of a Savior. It's really not a whole lot different for us today than it was for the Apostle Paul trying to distinguish between the Jew and the Gentile. You had a hard time convincing the Jews that Gentiles could be saved. And you had a hard time convincing the Jews that they needed to be saved in the same way that the Gentiles were saved. So Paul deals with this, this idea between the difference between the Jew and the Gentile, beginning in verse 12. He says, For as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles do not have the law by nature, do things in the law, these also, not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also being witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Now, that's a kind of a tongue-twisting section, and it's kind of confusing, so let's kind of walk through it verse by verse. In verse 12, he's talking about who the law applies to. When God gave Moses the law, it was not for the Gentile world, it was for the Jews. There were things in the law that were specific, the entire law was specific to the Jews, and God gave it to them specifically, and they were the ones who were going to be held to that standard. So he says, if you sin without the law, you'll also perish without the law. But if you sin with the law, then you're going to be judged by it. What he's trying to get across to us there is that God has a standard. God has a righteous law. And he judges us by that law fairly. And if you were a Jew, then you would be judged based on whether you follow the law or not. And if you were a Gentile, you didn't have to worry about the law because it didn't apply to you. Now, if you remember in the book of Acts, when the Gentiles started becoming Christians and started coming to know the Lord, the Jewish nation, the Jewish believers, almost right off the bat said, all right, for the, Jews to be, or for the Gentiles to be saved, they have to conform to the Jewish Old Testament law. They needed to be circumcised. They needed to, to follow all of the Old Testament Mosaic law. And that was one of the big battles in the, in the book of Acts, especially at the Jerusalem Council, where the apostles had to lay out once and for all that for Gentiles to be saved, they did not have to abide by law. It wasn't given for them. And because of what Christ had come and done, it was unnecessary to follow the Old Testament law because he fulfilled it perfectly. So when you look at verse 12... He lays out kind of the idea that the law applied to the Jews, it didn't apply to the Gentiles, and then we get in verses 13, 14, and 15 a parenthesis. So it's like he takes this, this pause and he wants to kind of explain what he's really getting at in verse 12. Well, in verse 13, he says, Not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but those who do it. What was one of the biggest problems that the Jews always had? They knew the law, but they didn't obey it. They knew that idol worship was wrong, but they did it anyway. They, they knew God's standard. It was taught to them. They knew what the law said. They knew what the expectation was. And they could hear it all day long, but hearing it didn't make them right before God. What made them right before God? Actually doing it. So he's making the point here, that with the Jews, it was great that they had a law, and it was great that they heard it, but it did no good if they didn't obey. Well, then in verse 14, he says, When Gentiles who do not have the law, in other words, when the, the Gentiles who are not held to the standard of the law, but they end up doing the things in the law, that becomes a law to themselves. So he's saying, the Gentiles were not held to the standard of the law. But because of their conscience and because of their 
um, seeking to do what was right, when they do the things that are actually contained in the law, he says that becomes almost the law in of itself. So what you had here, and this would have really irate, made the Jews irate, would be the idea that the Gentiles, who they many times considered to be nothing more than dogs, were actually kind of looked in a better light because they were doing what was in the law, but the Jews weren't. Then you get to verse 15, and he says, "...who show the work of the law written in their hearts." And here again, their conscience bearing witness between themselves and their thoughts, either accusing or excusing them. This really ties back to Romans chapter 1, verse 20, when he says, "...in the natural revelation of God, there is no excuse for anyone to say there is no God." So even the Gentiles who did not have the benefit of the Old Testament law and being taught what it says, they had the benefit of seeing God in His uh, revelation, His general revelation, and being able to understand that there is a God. And their, in work with their conscience, they ended up doing some of the things that the Jews were supposed to do in the law. So as you think about that, their conscience either convicted them or released them of any guilt. And all of this is in this parenthesis about who the law applies to. Now, again, this would have made the Jews very uncomfortable. This would have put the Jews and the Gentiles on the same level. Which is really where we all are, right? When it comes to sin, when it comes to salvation, there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. There is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. We are sinners in need of a Savior. And in verse 16, Paul says, there's coming a day when God's going to judge. I find it interesting the way he puts it here, the, the secrets of men. You see, the good moral person has a lot of secrets, don't they? Because while they may appear good and moral, they're still just as filthy, vile sinners as the rest of us. And those secrets that they think that they're keeping from everybody else will one day be exposed. They'll be exposed by Jesus Christ. And then he says, it's kind of interesting the way he puts it, according to my gospel. Paul's not talking about his gospel. He's talking about the gospel that he was given to preach. And the gospel he was given to preach is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, there's going to be a lot of good moral people in hell. I hate to say that. Really, I do. But there's going to be a lot of good moral people in hell. Because they can't come to the point where they recognize that they need a Savior. Some of the hardest people that you will ever run across to witness to. Some of the hardest people in the world to convince that they need a relationship with Jesus Christ. So what do we as believers do? You know, as I've gone through chapter 1 and even this part, first part of chapter 2, most of us here tonight that are believers and have been saved for any length of time at all, this is pretty basic stuff for us. We know that we're all sinners. We know that God's going to judge that sin righteously. And as, I, as I've been going through this portion of Scripture, one of the things that's been really, I guess, impressed upon me is how do we go about explaining this to people that we know need a relationship with Christ? To those good, moral people. You know, it, it's not about... And, and this is one of the ways I, I guess I'm going to encourage you to talk to them. We need to show them that it's not about what they do. It's about what Jesus did. Do, do you see the difference between those two things? The good moral person thinks that as long as they're good enough, as long as they do enough good things, and as long as they're better than the person next to them, they're going to get into heaven. And we have to be able to show them as believers that it's not about what we do. It's about what Jesus did. 
we have to show them that the measuring stick is not you and I as believers. It's not some church or some preacher or some other Christian, quote-unquote Christian, that they know. That is not the standard that they are to measure themselves by. The standard is the standard of Jesus Christ. And if you show them the perfect holiness and righteousness of Jesus Christ and what He did on the cross for us, and show them it's about what He did, then we have an opportunity to lead them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to stand here and pretend that it's easy. It's not. But we have to continually present them the gospel. We have to continue to let the the Word of God speak to their hearts and their minds and and pray that the Holy Spirit will, will soften their hearts, will soften their minds, will make them receptive to the truth of who they really are. It's a big task. It's a difficult task. But with the power of the Holy Spirit within us and the Word of God that He's given us, we have the ability, we have the tools to reach good, moral people with the Gospel of Christ and see them come to a saving knowledge of Him. All right, let's stand together tonight. We'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. Father, as we come to You in prayer tonight, I thank You for Your Word. I thank You for uh, the book of Romans that we're studying right now. And Father, I know as sure as I stand here right now that every one of us in this room we know some of the people that this describes we know some very good moral people that um, need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and Father while I don't know all the names you do you know exactly who's on our hearts you know exactly who's on our minds right now and my prayer is that you would prepare these individuals for us to get before them and share the gospel of Jesus Christ And Father, I pray that you would give them understanding and and show them that they have a need for a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for each of us here tonight that you would give us the very words that we need to say when we're before them. Father, help us to just very plainly and simply communicate to them what Jesus Christ did for us and what your word says about the need for a Savior. And Father, that as we speak, that you would just, uh, through the power of your Holy Spirit, draw these individuals to yourself. Father, I pray as we leave here tonight that you would prepare us those opportunities. And Father, when they present themselves this week, give us the boldness to speak for you. Father, we love you. We thank you and praise you most of all for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.